Well, I've, I've, I've had this down pat a dozen times now. Scuba Obsessed is a weekly podcast. We talk about all things scuba diving from cool new gear, places to dive, and scuba in the news. Scuba Obsessed, episode 510, is recorded live October 7th, 2021. Welcome back to Scuba Obsessed. I'm Darren Gilson coming to you from the southwest side of the great state of Michigan. We're joining me this week. We have Mac, the dive mentor. How you doing today, Mac? Well, I'm doing pretty good and glad to be here. Excellent. So we, we had a little bit of rain this week. Uh, We've had a lot of rain this week and uh, walked out of my house, I think, yesterday. Looked at the green tree across the street, and then I looked at all the freaking leaves that are all over the place. Ah. Which means the river is going to be horrible. Yes, it will be. Those leaves got to go somewhere, and they tend to like yeah. the, like that river. What type of leaves do you have down in your yard? Maple. Maple have started. Yep. Yeah. You're not that much farther north than me. I don't think I've got any maple on the ground yet. But the poplars have just about given up the last of their leaves, which they're kind of the first ones. Um, yeah, I'm surprised. Now, you're a little bit closer to the lake, but usually that's, that's a little yeah. bit warmer. Um, well, I mean, they're, they're, these are big trees, and they're still green, but I'm looking at the bottom and it says, damn. I mean, he's already been out there mulching and picking them up, bagging them. Mm -hmm. I don't have any trees in my yard, but I have a lot of leaves once in a while. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to decide. I, I've, I have been bad about mowing, so I got to get caught up on that again. Okay. Just, just a little bit more editing for me, but not too bad. So... Uh, we were talking about the leaves, weren't we? So we had <laughs> <laughs> something, something like leaves. Uh, yeah, because the leaves and the accumulation in the river. Yeah, so we'll have some some leaves in the river. Kind of covers things up, so we can't quite see what we're looking for. So hope, hopefully, we don't. It, you get some diving in before it's completely invisible or invisible. No, invisible would be invisible. So, what am I obscured? Is that is that what I should be saying? The the bottom will be obscured. Absolutely, covered over. Covered over, a mess. Maybe is the better term. Yeah. It will certainly be a mess. So thank everybody who's in the chat room right now. We have Dave and Eric and Karen and I think I saw some others in YouTube. So uh, we've got Discord chat. We also have YouTube chat going on. Uh, we had Josh in there. Thank you, Josh, for, for joining us and giving us some audio feedback. We're going to get this down. I don't get this better. Uh, I've It took me quite a while. I, I think I'm too, oh, probably 10 hours of editing for every hour of video, and our episodes are about an hour, an hour and a half. So it, it's a ridiculous amount of time, but uh, my goal is to get that down to about two hours per hour, uh, which I think is pretty reasonable for a live stream. Uh, but thank you for being in the chat room. So let's go ahead and jump right on into the news this week. We've got a short article list. So that shouldn't take us too long to blast right through these. Well, the first one we have up on the list is historic shipwreck uncovered near, and I don't even know how you say that. What's a what's R and an I and a G and an A and that 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 I is long. Is that Riga? You know, everybody knows us Americans were terrible with all the umlauts and stuff on top of top of it. Uh so it says two weeks ago the office and the Freeport of Riga received information from the Association of and I'm not pronouncing that <laughs> about a a fragment of wooden shipwreck exposed on, oh my goodness, <laughs> beach. <laughs> I'm making up my own words. 
Uh, when inspecting the objects, employees of the administration found that there were three ends of oak cladding boards that had been exposed on the water's edge, but under the tidal sands, it is possible to feel the wreck fragment at least 1.3 meters and 4 meters in size. As soon as the water level rose, part of the wreck disappeared under the waves again. In the middle of last week, the wreck was exposed again, and with the permission of the authority, the employees of the Freeport of Riga began excavating the fragment of the wreck, quickly revealing the wreck was much larger than originally it estimated. It's at least 12 meters long and 3.5 meters wide. The exposed fragment is the side of an oak-built ship, only its exterior covered with massive 25 centimeter wide and 8 centimeter thick planks is visible. They're attached to the ribs of the ships, which are not yet possible to measure both the wood and the copper pins. Thousands of small copper nails remain on the outside, which indicates the ship was clad with copper plates. And this is part of the side that was under the water when the ship was in use. There is a pronounced curvature in the side of the ship, which begins to level towards the end of the fragment, which probably indicates the bow of the ship may be in the direction of the dunes. It is still difficult to draw precise conclusions, but the fact the ship is clad with copper plates indicate it was either a warship or a long-distance merchant ship that had sailed not only through the Baltic and the North Sea, but also further voyages to the tropics. Copper cladding was first used by British boats in the late 18th century, so most likely the wreck dates from the 19th century. Knowing the current coastal area uh, near the lighthouse was formed and strengthened only in the middle of the 19th century, it might be the wreck could date to the first half of the 19th. So it's possible it's about five, 150 to 200 years old. On the other hand, the lack of saw marks and copper plates in the end of the wreck indicates the ship was at least partially divided into timber after the accident and the valuable copper plates removed from it. In order to ensure the continued preservation of the wreck and protect the wooden structures from rapid uh, degradation in the sun and air together with representatives of the free port of Riga decide to fill the site so it could be returned to moisture and coolness where it has been preserved for at least 150 years. This week the board decided on granting status a newly discovered cultural monument to the wreck exposed on the beach. It'll make it possible to carry out necessary additional research in the near future to find out size, more accurate date, as well as ensure further preservation of the wreck. There's an image there that we got shown right there online. Uh, I got four people standing on the wreck. Got a front end loader piling up some sand. Must be in preparations. They knew they were going to bury it. Uh, but, but that's got a nice curvature to it. Compared to what we've been seeing, mm -hmm. that looks like a nice wreck that might be interesting to excavate. Yeah. Especially to see if there's something on the backside or... Is it hollowed out? Is there an interior? And is there any material there? Yeah. So they're thinking because it was copper clad that it's pretty much already been salvaged. Uh, so it, it ran up on the ground. Uh, you know, once they determined they couldn't resail uh, it, then they stripped what they could off it. But it's, I'm, I'm surprised at just, you know, just, just the size and substance of those oak boards they've got there just... It would have been interesting to know what the coastline looked like 50 years, 100 years ago to see where the water level was. Mm -hmm. Meaning, was that floating when it went ashore? Where it went ashore at now, is is that where it was originally? Mm -hmm. On the bottom and it got covered over? Yeah. Well, if you look at this... Because it almost looks like a dune on the backside. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if we can... Yeah. Overhead shot is where we'll see that. That's zipping through that, probably giving everybody a little seasickness but yeah you can see it's you got the, the coastline there you got the dunes um so this you is know, a, this the second the second shot shows how the dune must be 15 feet of dirt mm -hmm. for the one they've got the two guys on it digging mm -hmm. going back towards the dune you can see how high that is so that that would be quite interesting i wonder if the um Underwater, not underwater, but the underground sonar they use for looking for caves and yep. what have you. Yep. I wonder if that would be any value to find out, is it hollow or is it full of sand? Yeah, so the ground penetrating radar, you're wondering if they could determine. Yes. Yeah, uh, I yep. wonder. Uh, looking at this piece that I've got up on the screen now, it looks like there's a section cut, doesn't it? I yeah, mean, very sharp. Very sharp edge, you know, those those planks wouldn't have naturally yep. stopped there. So there was something being done. So we don't know 
is this the only part of the wreck that's here? You know, is this part of a larger salvage operation someplace else? And this was something that, you know, floated off and they went, oh, who cares? Uh, or is that the whole wreck was here on this section of beach? Yeah, that ground penetrating radar, that might be worth it. And at the least, try putting prods down to see if they have contact how far inland. Mm -hmm. So here, what I'm trying to pull up, we'll see how this shows up. Some of these, uh, they've got a 3D model that somebody's made. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Yeah, see that? Almost looks like a whale. It does. Yeah, a little bit of a bleen there kind of look. Yeah, to me, now, this is a shipwreck as opposed to a bunch of boards laying on the beach like we've been looking at lately. Mm -hmm. That, to me, has potential. Yeah. And it's a lot different than what we've seen. You know, the, the, the flayed open wrecks that we see around here, you know, they're all about the same age and, you know, pretty broken down. You know, it's, it's nice to see. It's a good thing for the dive on. But this seems to be unique enough and different enough that others that it's worth an investigation. Oh. Yeah. And I like it when they give us those 3D models. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see what else do we have. Oh, th this one was on Healthline. Uh, and normally I would recommend taking a look at... Uh, you know, Dan, but the, the article caught me. It says, can you go scuba diving with asthma? And then, of course, you know, they're, they got the line what you need to know. Uh, I mean, so, so what, you know, without reading into this, what is the normal convention for asthma? It's like that's considered breathing problem and having an asthma attack underwater would not be a good thing. Well, it's narrowed airways, and to me, that sounds like if you got any mucus blockage and you start coming back up, you're going to have a, a very bad day. Yeah. So we'll have the link in the show notes, so if you want to read this, I, we always recommend going to Dan. Uh, but um, they're kind of indicating that it's it's not no, never. But of course, you need to be cleared by your doctor. And they're saying that actually somebody with asthma may be safer than somebody with other conditions that are either not managed or undiagnosed. But you know, if you're undiagnosed, yeah, that's bad. How many people do we know that have asthma? I've got sister-in-law who's got asthma. I mean, it, to me, and I... I you know, again, not a doctor, uh, but, you know, usually growing up, people who I knew had asthma, you know, they said they had asthma, they're taking medication for asthma, and they usually had an inhaler that they yeah. could breathe into if they had an attack. Um, and some of them were swimmers, and I know one of them is a competitive swimmer, but there were situations and times when they would need that inhaler. Uh, so, you you... You would want to, if you've got asthma, talk to your doctor, explain that you want to do, and then uh, also maybe talk to a uh, diving physician uh, just to double check. Because as great as diving is, it's not worth dying over. It also makes you wonder if shallow water diving would be more tolerable than deep water diving. I would. I mean, I think you could make that case, but not knowing how, how does attack happen. I mean, if you're in four feet of water and if the attack is to the point to, you, know, you couldn't stand up, I don't know what that condition is. You know, the people I know with, with asthma, uh, they kind of have, they, they know something's coming on, uh, you know, they get the inhaler out. So maybe depending on what your situation is, how long you have before you know the attack, uh, would would affect it, but like grubbing in the river, you know, I think it could be reasonable to make, uh, you know, that they may say that would be fine. Uh, it said according to the Undersea and Hyperbaric Medical Society, doctors typically assess assess 
whether you can safely die with asthma by determining how well your asthma is controlled, what your triggers are. While eval evaluating whether you can safely die with asthma, your doctor will likely consider factors such as your asthma history, results of allergy tests, that's <laughs> spirometry, not familiar with that term, and result of a bronchial challenge test. People with a history of sudden asthma attacks may not make a good candidate for diving, which is kind of what we were thinking. People with asthma induced by exercise, cold, or emotion such as stress also may not make good candidates. Test of uh, results of allergy tests, contaminants, and compressed air, such as pollen, can potentially trigger asthma attack in some people. Now, yes, contaminants could, but it isn't. Uh, compressed air, some of the cleanest air you can breathe. It, well, I'm, right, I'm reading this one aspect. If the breathing tank is contaminated with pollen, but if I had my air going through a carbon filter plus a few other items, mm -hmm. I would hope that the pollen allergens would be, you know, captured by the uh, filters. Right. So it's not saying it's impossible to have those type of contaminants, but uh, a well-run air filtration system shouldn't have them in it because uh, i know a lot of people who cut the grass wear the mask mm -hmm. when it's you know pollen like this or in florida and that makes a big difference so if the mask is going to stop that pollen i would certainly hope the carbon filters would do it yeah there's because there's a specific filter that is required to be on the compressors used for commercial operations and also uh, the particular rated and replaced so, yeah, I'm kind of surprised on that one. Uh, and then here they're saying that that test I couldn't pronounce measures how well your lungs function. The test involves breathing into a machine that measures the amount and rate you can inhale and exhale. Uh, a bronchial challenge test. Uh, some diving societies recommend that people with asthma pass a bronchial challenge test, sometimes called uh, methachlorine challenge test or bronchial provocation test for diving. This test involves inhaling the drug uh, methachlorine, uh, yeah, chlorine, which causes your airways to narrow. The goal of the test is to measure how reactive your lungs are and your level of airway irritability. It's also conducted with supervision by a doctor, so there's no need to be concerned that your reaction will be severe and dangerous. Yep, so here's some safety tips that they have. Uh, before diving with asthma, the United Kingdom Diving Medical Committee recommends the following. Measure peak flow at least twice per day for at least three days before diving. And avoid diving if your score drops below 15% normal. So that must be a test that you can do by yourself, because I can't believe you'd go into a clinical situation and be tested daily for three days. Remember the one whenever you had surgery yep. and you had to blow into the tube and you could watch it go up and down yep. and they could tell how much volume and capacitance you had mm -hmm. that I wonder if that's what they're talking about yeah. here. Yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, Karen uh, is saying uh, well-controlled asthma shouldn't be a barrier. If you haven't had any use of a rescue inhaler in months or years, I wouldn't be concerned. Controlled fine. Brittle. No. Uh, so they're saying if your peak flow is, is normal for at least 48 hours, if you use a re avoid diving until your peak flow is normal for at least 48 hours. If you use a rescue inhaler, abandon your dive. If you become wheezy or short of breath at any point, that makes sense. Even without asthma, ascend slowly from your dive, particularly in the last five meters, because those last five meters is the biggest uh, change. Take a rescue inhaler 30 minutes before diving to reduce the risk of bronchospasm. Seek medical advice before diving if there are any changes in your asthma control. Other ways to stay safe while diving include avoid diving if your asthma is exasperated by cold exercise or emotion. Always discuss your asthma with a doctor before diving. Avoid diving if you experience breathing problems or flare-up of symptoms. Never dive alone. Do not dive if you can congestion in your nose and ears. Follow your diving instructor's directions. 
I would definitely think the congestion in your nose or ears, and that can be besides having an aller, besides having an allergy or uh, what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have a head congestion. You sure as heck really shouldn't be diving. Yeah, and then uh, Karen also says typically if a pool chlorine makes you wheeze, probably not a good idea, and I, and I would agree. And our non-medical opinions. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, seek uh, dev- advice from qualified um, medical staff. Not people you hear on the internet. Yeah, talk to your doctor. Yep. So this this next article, uh, my dad actually sent me to the sent me this one. So. Uh, uh, this is a series that's being published uh, on the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. And this was this article is actually sent by them. So kind of interesting. It's it's being sent by and written by. Is that if I'm if I'm understanding? Uh, so this is um, you know Wayne Lasardi wrote this. And isn't Wayne the state archaeologist? I believe he is. Yeah, so he's the state archaeologist. Um, all the preserves uh, typically uh, report into him in some way or fashion. Uh, but this article goes on and talks about uh, the Tuskegee Airmen that were in Michigan. And they're, they're talking about... Uh, See if we get to the spot where we can go in without reading the whole article. Um, yeah, so it's like this. So on April eleventh, twenty fourteen, exactly seven years, seventy years to the day after the crash, David. Lewinsky and his son Drew discovered a wrecked airplane while diving from Lake Huron. They were surveying the lake bottom where a tugboat and barge sank in 2012 when they happened across what they thought was an automobile door. According to Dave Losinski, a few yards later we discovered a wing and we knew we had found an airplane. We contacted Wayne Lasardi with the state of Michigan to see about getting a permit to put some of the airplane back together in the lake bottom to serve as a recreational dive site. Osinski's father and son team spent a year uh, searching the lake bottom for parts of the airplane and clues to its demise. They eventually found the forward instrument panel that featured, along with a cluster of gauges, the airplane's radio call sign. That positively identified the wreck as the Era Cobra flown by Lieutenant Moody. In July 2015, I began suiting up for the dive from Losinski's charter boat dive version. Uh, Drew and I jumped into 70 degrees water, descended to 34 feet to the lake bottom. Warm water usually means visibility is reduced because of the algae bloom, but natural sunlight that day allowed us to see 30 to 40 feet. The wings of Lieutenant Moody's plane came into view immediately. All they were separated by the fuselage and missing portions of the flap, ailerons and starboard wingtips, the wings were fairly intact. They are lying flat in the bottom and partially buried in the sediment. Five-point star insignia in the field of blue can be seen on the port side wing, Traces of the red border extend outward of the star. The red teardrop-shaped plastic running lights is positioned on the dorsal surface near the port side wing tips. The two main landing gear are tucked up inside the wings, one with a tire still holding air from 1944. The framework between the wings holds a collection of aircraft components, including a throttle, mixture control valves, uh, a pre-stone coolant radiator, a pre-stone, press stone, you forget some of the marketing there. Uh, fragmented aluminum canopy, frame containing glass fragments, two oil coolers, armor glass windshield, and the port side door. Uh, Drew and I did a half dozen more dives that day and served as my personal tour guide and the propeller, the gearbox, instrument panel, engine tail, finally the machine guns. It was easy to recognize the importance of the site, although fragmented and spread out over a square mile of lake bottom. Era Cobra Rex soon became the first of its kind associated with the Tuskegee Airmen to be archaeologically documented. Following a preliminary site visit, the aircraft rec- wreckage was issued a Michigan archaeological site number 20SC-177, returned home to Alpena, immediately telephoned a friend, Eric Denson, who worked as the chief electrical engineer for NASA at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, 
Tuskegee Airmen are my heroes, Denton said. I'll be proud to be part of this project. In August 2015, I returned to the airplane wreck site, this time with Denison and a group of volunteers from the National Association of Black Scuba Divers. We spent a week recording all visible artifacts carrying on the work that David and Drew Lozinski had started the year before. At the conclusion of the 2015 field project, the team met with Brian, Dr. Brian Smith of the National Museum of Tuskegee Airmen, then located in Old Fort Wayne in Detroit. Dr. Smith was equally excited about the project. In 2018, he applied and was issued an archaeological recovery permit from the state of Michigan. Dr. Smith and I, with the help of volunteers, Captain Luke Clyburn, and the Noble Odyssey Foundation began a systematic recovery of select group of artifacts on the site in July 2018. A two-inch thick bulletproof windshield, the starboard side door manufactured by Hudson Motor Company, the forward instrument panel containing 16 gauges, the radio call sign, the wooden radio mask, and two sections of the steel drive shaft that connected the engine and the propeller were carefully left from the bottom of Lake Huron. Now, before I go any farther... Does the state have the rights to permit somebody to take up U.S. Navy property? Well, if you ask Taurus, <laughs> <laughs> the Navy does not like you to do that without their permission. Right. So I am assuming that the state was in concert with the Navy. Right. Yeah. So I think for the purpose of the article, they probably simplified some of the communication to make it uh, readable, but just from like you said, talking to Taurus and what we know, yeah, there, there, it had to been more than the state. So probably oh, what yeah. it could be is that the state could say no, and the Navy said yes, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, it's no, or the Navy says no, and the state says yes, and it's no. So they must. We're, we have to assume that they, uh, they cleared all the appropriate restrictions. So it says all. Yeah. All material recovered from the submerged archaeological sites go through a lengthy process to preserve the integrity of the artifacts, allow them to be dried out, analyzed, and exhibited. The recovery artifacts were transferred to the state's conservation laboratory located in the Great Lakes Maritime Heritage Center in Alpena, where I began the process of removing invasive mussels, stabilizing deteriorating metals, and recording all the details that can help with the wreck site as the archaeologists. Uh, as the artifacts were being cared for, the plans were simultaneously developing to document and recover the remaining remainder of the wreck site. The Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, the Energy, and the DNR reviewed the archaeological re recovery permit. Earlier this year, Dr. Smith and I organized a crew to continue documentation of the wreck and remove the artifacts from Lake Huron. Uh, latest development over the course of three weeks in August, 15 volunteer divers, two museum curators at the Michigan History Center and the Michigan Maritime Museum, Seven DNR conservation officers, a half dozen Michigan State police troopers, an assortment of media and documentary filmmakers, including Evan Pittman of the television show Wardens, my son Nicholas, converged in a small town of Lexington. Our mission was to record as much of the wreck plane as possible and follow meticulous documentations recover in all our cracks across the floor, lake floor. Of our artifacts were measured, photographed, precisely mapped, all under watchful eyes of video camera. They were then retrieved and transported to Detroit and Alpena for conservation. The final day in 2021, field season started differently than the previous three weeks had. There'd be no diving, no wetsuits, and tanks were not necessary. Instead, DNR conservation officer Craig Malowski and Pat Hartzig helped my daughter Eva and her friend Josh, both engineering students at the University of Michigan, load a remotely operated vehicle on board of the state patrol vessel. Eric Bryant and his wife Sally, daughter Lauren, also climbed the board, as did Tanya Anderson Dell, who lost her grandfather in the air forced plane crash in Alaska, who helped me contact Lieutenant Moody's relatives. Uh, and then they go on. Uh, you know, really, if you want to read this, we'll have this again in the show notes. Uh, but an interesting article. Very interesting. Yep. So, uh, you know, the credit Michigan Department of Natural Resources, unless otherwise noted, accompanying photos and text only version of the articles are available for download. And then they say, uh, plane recovery was Eric Bryant's nephew, Tuskegee Airman, Lieutenant Frank Moody examines the throttle. Oh, they're talking about what's in the photos. Okay. But, uh, very interesting. That was by Wayne Lassar. That was an interesting aircraft. 
Yep. We did not use it very much. We basically gave it to the Russians. <laughs> the aircraft? Yes, Sir Re Bob. It didn't have the performing characteristics of the P-47 or the P-51 Mustang. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't want to have to maintain multiple different aircraft, especially if they couldn't all do the same mission. So we gave them to the Russians, and they used them as tank busters. So with the cannon in the nose at 37 millimeter and the 450s, Mm -hmm. uh, they did a hell of a lot of damage. So the Russians really liked them. As a pilot, there's a little weird item. Um, you normally don't have a cannon fire into your nose, which is a little unique. And on this one, the door that you got into opened out so that if you're going at 280 miles an hour, Try to open that door. <laughs> it's not going to be right. If you, you know, suicide doors, if you started to crack them open, the wind will hit it and rip them off. Uh -huh. Those doors opened into the wind. So you got to get the canopy off to get out. Yeah, I could see where you did. That might be a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, they had one of those at uh, Oshkosh, matter of fact, last year again, or this year. Which was, I always love to look at it. It's, it's a really unique aircraft. Okay, so let's see the next one. As as you were talking there, I was, I was doodling uh, in, the, in the window. Fixing some stuff, gosh. So is it Music City or the cruise? The next one is the, yeah, let's go, that's uh, Music City. Let's get this one queued up. So the Inquisitor, uh, in inquisitionnashville.com, a new scuba uh, Music City party bus hopes to bring a new meeting to Dive Bar. Uh, Nashville Transportation Association unveiled the city's newest edition Wednesday with the Scuba Music City Party Bus. And this just almost doesn't even seem possible. I, I was looking around to see if it was a joke article. The 150,000 gallon aquarium on wheels gives visitors a whole new way to experience downtown Nashville, all under the supervision of a Patty certified dive instructor. We want to bring a new meeting to Dive Bar, said owner our operator Barney Jenkins. The one-hour tour offers customers a two-tank dive, an unlimited rum punch. A shark encounter is also available for additional fee. So, so before we go on, who, what kind of liability insurance do you have for diving with an unlimited <laughs> rum punch? Well, so unlimited alcohol and swimming with sharks – Really sounds like a good combination, doesn't it? <laughs> well, well, how about we just like throw some explosives in? You know, maybe some underwater guns and wow, yeah. But I, I'm there though. <laughs> it's like I, you, let me go. Uh, we we need a little more information on this party bus here. Yeah, unlimited alcohol and swimming with sharks on a bus in downtown Nashville. Sign me up," said one man we <laughs> spoke to along Broadway. That's what we're thinking. Uh, the Scuba Music City Party Bus is currently accepting reservations. Plans to open this Friday. That'd be tomorrow. I'm ready. Let's go. You think that we that we can we'll get the uh, discount? You know. We need more information on this one. That's that's all there is to Let's it. See, it says follow us, book us now, Scuba City Music Party Bus. So you don't get to see my. Okay, we're gonna do the great big book of everything, Google or Wikipedia, or whoever ends up giving us the results we want. Scuba, Let's see, Scuba City Party Bus, because we need some more information about this. Okay, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I've got the one with the hot tub. I understand that one. Yeah, so when you say hot tub, uh, so 
here here's here's that one um so i'm thinking that this is the the same yeah bride squad yeah the bachelorette parties we need some pictures here you you're not seeing the pictures Oh, I'm I'm also doing another search. Okay, now you're missing them. <laughs> I I was no, I, not you, no. You you probably want the pictures I just found. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see what else can I find. So that's the it's a party tub, Music City party tub, and let's see the so the party tub. Pricing, rental, call, call, call. Um, let me see. Tuesday through Sunday, it's five hundred and twenty-five dollars. Are two hours enough? Only one hundred and sixty dollars for an additional hour. So five twenty-five for the first two hours, one hundred sixty for the additional hour. Uh, yeah, some of these images. Why do I need a a panty guy though? Hugh Hefner maybe, but I don't know about a panty guy. You you want Hugh Hefner? <laughs> well, not him, but you know what I'm saying. That yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the other pictures of the bus itself. It's like shallow enough. Yeah. So why is there a panty guy involved in this? Yeah. So that so that's Music City Party Tub. I just guess is it Music City Party Bus Scuba? Well, Nashville, Nashville is Music City. Well, right, but I'm trying to figure out. You know, they're obviously trying to promote this. So why am I not seeing a link to it? Um, that's. Oh, you know what it is? It's the same bus. So here, here, let me. Right. It, I guess it just depends on how fill you full it. Uh, how fill you? Full. Oh, oh, there you go. So doesn't that look the same? How filled you full it? Fill you full it. Hey, what's that alcohol? Yeah, yeah there's no <laughs> alcohol in this rum punch. Um, oops, I'm not, that's not the one I was going for. Yeah, so here, so if we look at that one. And then we compare it to the, yeah, they're just, nah, that's not the picture I was looking for. Wow. Yeah, really, boss, I wasn't looking at anything. Uh, yeah, so it's the same, they, they've already built a vehicle that can handle the water. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard to tell. Uh, so somebody, if, if you're in Nashville, go find out. Could we do this as an excursion? You think we could, you know, maybe, you know, so 500, how many people does it fit? You know, here's the thing. You don't want to do the, you don't want to do the, uh, you don't want to pay to be on it. You want to be the patty guy. That's, that's the trick. The, the patty, the patty guy is the one who's making out like a bandit. Party bus. It doesn't even. I wonder what that weighs. Well, that's what I'm looking at. That's a double axle. I just saw that. Yeah, I was looking at that that's and a, the balance. So it's a double axle. There is just. That's why I thought it was a joke. I think that's a mock up there in this this photo that we've got up. There's just no way. How much water would that be? Scuba. Okay, we can we can burn a whole bunch of time on this. Oh, if anybody knows, let us know. If anybody's been on it, yeah, or in it, yeah, get get your GoPro, uh, show us some video. We want to see it. All right, yeah, upgrade, upgrade to the shark. I it just it just doesn't even seem possible. What was the date on that? Was there a date? Was that? Am I getting? Oh. 
something just doesn't seem right. Is it was that in April first that came back up? <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah, now they got us here, Mac. Let's look at the bottom. For more from more unbelievable stories, follow us on Facebook. The Inquisitor Nashville is a work of satire. So we've we've spent. And then it's on satire. We aim to promote positive mental health through the power of laughter. If you are someone experiencing mental health issues, please call the suicide prevention helpline. So, yeah, no, there is no such thing. We were we were correct in our assumption. As disappointed, yeah. where did the pictures am, come from? Well, it was where did the pictures come from. It was photoshopped. Are you sure? Yes, I'm. It is photoshopped. <laughs> so, if you look at that, because it's there's a Music City party bus, which that is real, and we had the pricing on it. So what they did is they, is that's not how the light would be moving through this image. Let me get this up so everybody's seeing it. That light wouldn't have been moving that way. Uh, you know, the shark, we should have known. I mean, this is, none of these look right. And then a two axle, again, because what, maybe 12,000 pounds an axle, 24,000 pounds. You know, that water would be significantly more weight than that so <laughs> and those tires would be begging for help so yeah the hot tub in the music city party bus is one thing but okay good job guys so there's there's a bunch of people now laughing at us that's okay but would you be laughing at us if we had this next one here You can live on a cruise ship for $350,000. And I would normally not consider this because I, that, that'd be a little bit trapped. But think of this as a the ultimate liveaboard. So um, what they're doing is they're, it's a new build condo ship. Um they're building a 741 foot long, 450 crew member, 55,000 gross ton, my narrative, with plans to take uh, its a liveaboard owners a leisurely path through the world's oceans, circumnavigating the globe over, globe over a period of three and a half years. The ship will spend three to five days in major ports, offering plenty of good times to explore. Storyline entered the private residence cruise mar line market with a primary focus on more affordable entry level options, selling studio and one bedroom homes at sea starting at three hundred fifty thousand for a two hundred thirty seven square foot space. Balcony condos start at five hundred thousand and offer three hundred thirty seven square feet of living and outdoor space. There are more expensive options from the onset, including a two story penthouse that resides at 1,529 square feet and an eye-watering $8 million price tag. But Storyline reports many consumers request the intermediate two- and three-bedroom options. In response, the U.S.-based startup company has reconfigured smaller residents, creating 84 larger upscale homes at sea, ranging from 909 to 1,400 square foot, with prices starting from 2.4 by five million dollars uh storyline business model sees past year owners paying up front to lease the accommodations for 12 to 60 years the condo cabins can be resold during the lease period if the resident wishes or they can be rented out to private to provide income initially there were 627 uh, residential units for sale the number is smaller after the reconfiguration so for people in the real estate market they will recognize is that we're having problems, so we're trying to sell the last units. We have a condo here in St. Joe that I think they've had to repaint the signs two or three times. You know, the one with the empty lot uh, there by Whitcomb? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's always promising, you know, this summer, I think is what it, it perpetually is. Uh, on that billboard, but it's been 10 years. And that's what it's running into. The amount of money they need to make the start to construction, you know, they want to pre-sell most of the units. And they're ha it appears, allegedly, they're having a hard time getting there. Uh, we've seen very strong demand for the bigger residents around 1,000 square feet and up from the savvy business professionals everywhere. So the rework of the residents in some more public spaces accommodate was a logical move. 
as with condos and landers, uh, there are monthly fees to maintain the ship and its facilities and amen amenities. But storyline fees starting at 2365 per person per month include much more. All meals, wine, beer, select spirits, gratuities, high-speed, Wi-Fi, laundry pickup, wash and fold, onboard activities, entertainment, visits, the onboard physician, yoga, fitness center, and the use of gym facilities. So if you've got normal things you'd like to find a ship this size, it's a big twist, long-term, live-aboard style. Um, yeah, and it goes on. I mean, it's a it's a big sales pitch. And there's some some uh, but what they did talk about is that they do have uh, scuba diving equipment on the boat. Okay, it says the after the ship will be a marina area with kayak, scuba gear, and sailboats. So, but what I when I thought we could put this on is I was thinking. You know, if you're an avid diver and you had the money, you know, say say you're retiring, you you you've sold out of some dot com and you had a bunch of money, uh, especially if you're single. Uh, this this I don't you can I could sell this as a as a cost save if you wanted to dive all the time because you could. I mean, you're on the boat. You could make a pretty nice yacht for five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> Well, right, but how you? But that yacht's only going to be wherever you got your yacht. You know, on this, if you're going around the world, uh, you could conceivably be in a new port all the time. Uh, you know, and that and that monthly maintenance fee, yeah, it's a little pricey, but that's all your food. That's everything. So you could go with a smaller unit. I I could see a sweet spot being about a thousand square feet. If you could do a two bedroom thousand square foot and you could afford it now i'm sh i'm sure that the maintenance on it might be a little bit higher but i don't know i was just thinking i don't know you're, you're talking 350 to five hundred thousand dollars plus 2300 or 2400 dollars a month mm -hmm. for food and stuff that's that's a lot of yeah yeah i mean i'm not saying that i'm Gonna ever be able to afford to do that, but you know, if you're moderately well off, this is, could be an attractive option. I just remember the uh, cruise boats when the COVID started, and they wouldn't let you off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure that, that would uh, have been a lot of fun. That COVID may have made this a little bit tougher sail. Huh. Yeah, it's Karen said. Uh, cheaper than most assisted living places and a heck of a lot more fun. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I I just thought I'd bring that up. You you, you kind of crush my my dreams. So I guess we'll we'll go on. I don't know. Twenty three sixty five per month. That's pretty skimpy for most of the uh, quality senior living centers I've seen. Do you think they're, they're that that would be a good deal? Yeah, but I mean, this is that's not including full time care that you would get at a senior living. But this would be, you know, kind of the the more of the entry. But then again, you you've, yeah. you've got to have the money to get in in the first place, and and this is not done yet. You know that that's the thing. Uh, you got to put up the money now. Who knows how many years it's going to take them to get to it, and then they got to work their way out. So you have to have enough trust at this organization. Here's one. Here's one of the floor plans. The diagrams are always. I mean, they're really great. Yeah. The projected scenery shots. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got the pool on the inside. That looks pretty nice. Like you were saying at the aft end, you've got the zodiacs that would come out to go for your diving or mm -hmm. tooling around. Yeah. Th this this floor plan I'm showing right now. That's the two bedroom. Got a. Uh, a master bedroom. It's got a guest bedroom, walk-in closet, master bathrooms. That's two bathrooms. This has got to be the the two and a half million dollar one. Because that looks like that's a lot of room in there. Yeah, because those are. I mean, the the guest room's a nine by nine, which in a house would be small, but on a cruise ship, that's that's yeah. decent. Uh, 
You got to think if if these are that size, it's not going to be like a normal cruise ship where it's packed. Uh, you're going to have a lower resident density to volume. Uh, so they probably need a little bit less help on the board, on the boat. Well, if you're going to do it, they said you got to have at least a net worth of a minimum of $5 million. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that floor plan that they showed, that was called the Inspire. Uh, the Inspire was a... Th oh. Yeah, here it is. So the Inspire was a thousand sixty-four square feet, two bedroom, two bath. That to me would be the, the ideal. Uh, you know, the Envision eleven hundred eighty-five square feet, two bedroom, two bath, an extra deep oceanfront balcony. Oh, let's, huh. What are you what are you looking at? Well, I'm just looking at they're they're talking about the you know the imagine the imagine is nine hundred and nine square feet. The inspires a thousand sixty four. The envision is eleven eighty five. But they, they say I'm I'm betting one is a shared balcony where the other is a private. Just reading for uh, a deep three hundred and sixty eight square foot oceanfront balcony for an additional indoor outdoor living space. Uh Outdoor bar, the 12, uh, 14, sprawl open. But you, you, you think about it. This is for the people who can't afford the, you know, the, you know, $200 million yachts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is the poor rich people. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, th these are all uh, renders that we're seeing in here. Like we'd. See if can I click on the photo. Is it going to show me anything? Nah. This is kind of the. And everything sized to make it look bigger. Okay. I don't know. I think I'd like to have the, uh, be on the Disney cruise ship and then just have my meals and stuff. I think that'd be cool. Yeah. I mean, that. I think that's good for, you know, maybe a few weeks, but those are tiny rooms i mean those are pretty much like you've got a bed and a tv and maybe a bathroom yeah. <laughs> ah cool i mean i've never really considered myself to be a cruise guy but the, this one i, I could kind of go for especially if it went to places where we could do some diving <laughs> Well, if they if they parked into the harbor so they could go do your visiting, mm -hmm. a lot of the harbors are not the best place to be diving. No, I agree. You're not. You're not. I would not. They say they've got a dive shop on this. So what I'm thinking is that would be the boat gets to port. You're going to be there at port for five days. The boat itself has, you know, landing craft that you can get on. And then go yeah. out and do some diving. So maybe you get, you know, five, six other divers together and you go out. So I don't know what, what that costs or how that works. In interesting idea. I can dream, can I? Well, when, when you get that 10 million, so you're well endowed for money, let us know. Yeah. Or you can do the podcast. I mean, they're going to have really good Wi-Fi. Yeah. Well, if, I, if of course, I, I think... This would probably not be what I'd do if I'd had that money. I'd probably get a nice boat out here and we'd just have fun out in the lake. I mean, there's plenty of diving I'd love to do here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah so, uh, interesting. Uh, somebody just give me 100, 200 million. That's why I don't play the lottery. You know, I can't, <laughs> you know, the 10 million's not enough. I need more. Um, uh... I could try on 10 mil. But I then, might buy a rebreather for sure then. Yeah, I yeah, I, I think a rebreather would be on it. You'd have to you'd have to have one a different color for each day of the week though if you had 10 million. Probably not. <laughs> so that does it for scuba in the news. Um so diving, did anybody get any diving in this last week? I know we had a little bit of uh rain going on. Little little we had a good bit of rain. Little moisture. I'm trying to remember back because last weekend, Saturday and Sunday, I didn't. That's why my, I mean, I was already behind a little bit on mowing, and then we had even more rain. 
I do believe Bob made the uh, meet and greet. Uh, yep, that's true. Jim Olaf. That was probably the biggest item. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim and I spent a little time in the water on Friday over in Pawpaw, or, uh, well, Pawpaw Lake. Mm -hmm. It was a work-related item, but uh, water was nice. Not a lot of boaters out there. End of the year, everybody's taking up their docks and gangplanks and all that kind of stuff. But the uh, water was not really cold. Uh, clarity was still there, but she had an algae bloom on it, uh, green and blue. So stay away from the blue stuff. So you said, uh, did you see the blue algae or did somebody else talk yeah, about no, it? Yeah, no. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was reported that Little Pawpaw had a toxic bloom, and I never could get any confirmation of where uh, that came from. When we're out there Friday, all again, the, the docking and stuff was green in certain areas. Uh, you'd actually have blue. Hmm. Once you got out past, you know, six, seven feet away from shore and away from objects, uh, you didn't have it, but it was coming up against the shoreline for sure. Okay. Yeah. Trying to think of how can I I show some of these photos. I'll apologize in advance if somebody didn't want us to share these. You see that one there? Somebody we know getting out of the water? Yep. Looks like Mr. Bob. And Mr. Bob Sweeney. He's, and the, on the podcast, we called him Boat Captain. I think he might have been on episode two or three, one of the early ones. Uh, well, actually, uh, I know Jim went out the other day. They got the uh, buoys for the St. Joe Yacht Club. Mm -hmm. I know they pulled up one of the buoys. I believe that uh, yep. Big John... Yep. Went out and got the buoy off the Havana. Havana buoy's up. So people have been getting out and getting wet. Yep. That's Dennis. I believe, isn't that who that is? Oh, one of our newest members, too. He's in the Caribbean this week. Oh, is he? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there it looks like he's at Gilboa. I'm hearing good things about Gilboa. Uh, a lot of improvements well, with the going change. on. Yeah, the new owners. Yep, the changes. Yeah. So there's, uh, you know, an example of the campsite. I know exactly right where that is. I've been down those steps uh, many times early in my dive training. Yep, Bob and Dennis there. So thank you. So, yeah, there's some, some nice photos there. Let me see. I don't want to. So we don't have permission from all these people to put on. Let's see if I got anything else we can. Yeah, this one's pretty tame. Some tanks there. And then there you're looking out. So this is to give you an idea. This would be one of the camping sites. And that's looking the quarry. So Gilboa quarry was, uh, uh, I think it was a limestone quarry, wasn't it? Uh, in, the, don't know. in the Ohio area. Let's see what else we've got. Yeah, so that's that's the photos we have there. Yeah. So, but yeah, uh, Great Lakes Wrecking Crew is what that is. They have they usually have a, a meet and greet in the fall here in October, and they have one in the spring. Okay. And. Uh, I, I still can't believe all the years I've never made that. So that needs to be on my list for this next year. So, any any dives happening this weekend? Do we know of any? I picked up a couple of tanks today. Depending on what the weather's going to be like, I'll probably do a, one of those Minutemen. Hey, we're going to go out at high noon on Saturday. 
but it's supposed to rain again. So we'll see where that takes us. Okay. Well, good. Yeah, we're get, it's getting a little bit chillier. And we talked about earlier in the show, we got leaves coming down. So, uh, you know, if you get in the water. Well, you definitely wanted a hood and a uh, and gloves for last week's dive. That was uh, especially in the river. Mm-hmm. So did you have, have you had to upgrade to a new pair of uh, gloves yet? Matter of fact, I bought a new pair today. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I just ripped up the last pair. So I got wow. a pair of five mils. I could not believe they were like 75 bucks. But I got the nice ones, you know, with the zip and the inner lining. Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm appreciating some of these luxury features in the gloves. The zippers uh, certainly yep. make sense. Yeah, I got my seven mils for the dry suit I have, but I got a five mils for grubbing. Uh-huh. Yeah, what, what I like about the zippers is if they if they're properly fitting, when you zip them up, they're tight. They're worth it. I can't. Yeah, I can't tell me how many gloves I've ruined because you're trying to rush. You feel like you're holding people up, getting your gear on, or you're struggling in the water. It seems like when your hands get wet, it's hard to push through that neoprene. And then uh, there's only so much pulling they can handle. And you might be able to get a, a dozen dives out of it, but at some point you're going to pull those seams out and shred that neoprene. So worth upgrading and spending a little bit more in the beginning to get something nice. Or not. Or not. Buy the cheap stuff and then just know you're going to be replacing it fairly soon. Just like my wetsuit. I've, well, I've always heard yeah? that yeah. wetsuits are generally good for about 100 dives. Oh. And the reason they last most divers is because they get out of the sport within five years. But I wear out a suit in two years, yeah. and it's always the same spot. It's wherever they have the knee pads, yeah. that juncture at mm-hmm. the top of the knee will separate. And the other is in your crotch, because when you keep, you know, you pull it up, it stretches it. So darn it, that's the first place that the neoprene separates from the webbing. Mm-hmm. or the fabric and then you get a little bit of ingress of water which sort of ruins it yeah 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 the, you're right the knees is a spot uh you know mine it's uh there by the zipper and the, around the neck i've uh pulled it open to uh cool myself down in the hot summer and you're sitting there cooking on a boat and you want to jump in and get uh cool down a little bit uh, Get some water in that well, wetsuit. I got. I bought two suits the other day, well, last month, uh, off the rack discounts at Wolf's. One was brand new, one was a uh, used. Got them for a very nice price. They weren't a hundred percent good fit. One was a little long. The neck was a big. Was quite big, but wearing a uh, shorty with a built-in hood. Mm-hmm. works wonderful yeah so i compensated for some of the uh not perfect fit but for the price you couldn't beat it now i do understand that there is an o- advanced open water class happening here in in southwest michigan i know they had one because i think uh not this week, week before last, they had an open water um, class because there was a little mix up on the pool work with the uh, high school. So they wound up having to do the uh, some of the extra diving and doing an extra dive over at Lake Cora. Mm-hmm. But I don't, I don't, I'm not sure what the uh, if that's completed or not. I know they have another one on the board already, though. Yeah, I'm seeing. Uh... This is from Wolf's and support your local dive shops, but uh, uh, they're our local one up here in the St. Joe area. Advanced open water class will be held. Uh, we'll be hosting a class at Gilboa Quarry the weekend of October yes. 16th and 17th. Advanced skills. Um, so if you haven't done open advanced, it's worth it. Um, you can do a, you, know, you pick a couple of different skills and you have some gear. Um, so you, you pay the entry fee and make sure you have the appropriate gear and it's worth it. It's like you got built in dive buddies and you do a class like that. Yeah. 
in Gilboa, that's a good spot. So usually what you plan <clears> on doing, uh, you can either camp there at the grounds or you can stay in a hotel room. Uh, usually the class is done uh, before the weekend's over, so you can, if you bring some extra tanks or have refilled, you can get some additional dives in. Yep. Oh. Now that photo there in the picture is not Gilboa, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I mean they have objects on the bottom, but <laughs> not quite that white sandy stuff. Not no no white sandy salt water and a uh, vessel like that. Correct. Going up there. Well, well, do you have a dive safety story for this week? Well, actually, I do. Uh, I got to try to look at it without looking weird on this, but uh, Lessons for Life. It's called Alone in a Crowd. And I got a, I'm working on two computers here. Ken was growing more uncomfortable by the minute. The current across the wreck was pushing him away from the rest of the divers. He was working hard to catch up to the group, but couldn't seem to get his breath. And his regulator didn't seem to be working correctly. Ken paused for a minute to look up. Then he went ahead and tried to hold on to the wreck to get everything under control. But when he looked up again, everybody was gone. He was alone. Now the diver. Ken was a 37-year-old open water diver with seven lifetime dives, including the four he made during his initial certification. He loved his new sport and was looking forward to spending as much time in the water as possible. He just hadn't found a regular buddy yet. He hoped spending a day on a boat with a group from his local dive shop would give him the opportunity to connect with the other divers so he could gain that valuable experience and find a buddy. The dive. When the group showed up at the dock, there were seven in total. The only divers on the small charter. A few had been diving for several years, but none was leadership level. They were all trained for open water and advanced open water, and had several specialties among them. Everyone but Ken had dove this wreck before, and they chatted along with themselves about what they would see. Now, Ken was excited to listen to the other divers to learn as much as he could, trying to take it all in. Since this group had been on the charter boat before and at this location, the dive master briefed the dive quickly and then told the divers to get into the water. The group decided to dive together as a large group rather than splitting into specific buddy teams. Ken made his way to the swim step, entered the water without any problems. The group planned to make a 30-minute dive to the wreck and see what they could see. The maximum depth of the dive was 80 foot to the sand. Now the accident. The dive master mentioned a strong current on the bottom, but Ken didn't know what that meant or how he could adjust his dive. He was simply following along. The dive group made it to the wreck and generally sheltered behind it as they swam the length of the boat. Ken stayed at the back of the group, slightly above the other divers, so he could keep an eye on everyone. He was working hard, dropping behind, and couldn't catch up. His breathing became more and more rapid, yet he felt as though he wasn't getting enough air. Ken paused for a moment to hold into the wreck so he could catch his breath, his mind was racing. He stopped and looked around. He couldn't see anybody in the group. He began to get worried. He ascended slightly above the wreck to see if he could see the rest of the group. And immediately he began to struggle again in the strong, strong current. He kicked as, kicked as hard as he could to get back to where he thought the other divers would be. Not realizing Ken was missing, the rest of the divers made their way back to the anchor line and ascended to the surface. They chatted about the dive, began exiting the water, when one diver saw Ken surface 40 yards from the boat. They heard him call for help, and then he disappeared. The analysis. Diving as a group isn't a bad thing per se, but the first mistake this group made was not assigning dive buddies. A group of seven who all agree to dive together can't work. It's too easy for somebody to get overlooked in the process, and it was pretty obvious here. 
This is especially true when one member of the diver or the group is significantly less experienced than the other divers. They were used to diving without Ken and no one remembered him until they got back to the surface because he was in the back, high and above. Having worked with this group before, the dive master did something that is natural and easy to do, but also wrong. He shortened his dive briefing, thinking that everyone had been on the dive before, not realizing Ken was new. Even if that weren't the case, the variable nature of the dive site meant dive leaders needed to give complete and detailed dive briefings on every dive. And they need to do their best to make sure everybody listens. During the dive, he should have stayed behind the wreck, meaning Ken, to shield himself from the current. And if he couldn't, to abort the dive when he realized he was in trouble. He could have signaled to any other divers that he was in trouble before it got serious. That diver could have helped him out. But again, he was back of the group. Panic is a principal cause of dive accidents. There is always some other triggering event that leads to panic. Ken was working so hard against swimming against the current in an unfamiliar environment that panic obviously sat in. From there, it was likely the only option Ken had in his mind was get to the surface where he knew he could breathe. Hitting the surface, Ken signaled for help, but number one, did not inflate his buoyancy compensator, and two, did not even drop his weight belt. Either of those actions could have possibly saved his life. It took the boat crew 45 minutes to find him and bring his body back to the surface. They attempted to resuscitate him, but those efforts failed. The autopsy showed that Ken had pulmonary vomitrauma and an aerial gas embolism, probably caused by a rapid ascent. Even though he still had air in the tank, Ken had held his breath when he bolted for the surface. The expanding air tore through his lung tissue, leaked into his air cavity, and to his blood circulation. He had stroke-like symptoms, including loss of consciousness. Lessons for life, dive with a buddy. If you plan to dive alone, seek the training, equipment, and experience, gather that experience, necessarily to do so safely. Practice self-rescue skills. This includes mask recovery, replacement, regulator recovery, clearing, gas management, and ditching your weights and orally inflating your BCD whenever in doubt. If you get separated from your buddy or group, look for your buddy no longer than a minute, then make a controlled ascent to the surface. If you're breathless underwater, find a stable surface to hold on to, catch your breath. Try to breathe slowly and deeply when underwater. Remember, depth increases your work of breathing. The air you're breathing is also denser. There's greater pressure on your lungs, so it's harder to get a full breath. Take your time, and above all, try not to panic. Nothing we already didn't know, but it's always interesting that when you panic, you forget to do the BC, you forget to drop the weights. And he had air, the BC would have worked. Yeah, yeah. I, I, just kind of a common thread. You know, that, that, yeah. Running out of air, panicking. Makes you wonder, though, if he had not been tail end Charlie. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he'd have been in the front, and we're always taught to dive with the abilities of the weakest link. I don't want to say weakest. Right. Oh, excuse me. The most inexperienced. Yep. And if he aborts, everybody aborts. You don't get pissed at him because he's learning. So again, it's stuff we we talk about every week almost, mm -hmm. but it always seems to be the same item. You're experienced or not, you get that fledgling part where you panic and everything goes right out the window. Mm -hmm. If you practice the other items, Simply having a bailout makes a hell of a difference. You got air, you got time. Exactly. And that calms people down. Yeah, uh, I was ignoring the chat room or there's just enough of a delay that we missed it. Um, 
some, some other diving that was going on, Jim took a couple of guys out to pull the racing markers. So that happened. Yep. Um, the what else we had? Dave said he pulled out an obstruction from the water inlet on a forty-two footer today. Does that count? I, I think so. That's a dive. He's in the water. Yeah, I will count that. <laughs> as much as Absolutely. my my vote counts, maybe maybe that's what we need to do. Offer, you know, we, we will certify dives. Uh, Karen says that <laughs> she was she's hoping I get out do some scanning this weekend if the lake is decent. Um. From what I've seen, because uh, I've got to uh, do some stuff for robotics this weekend, uh, there's some chance of rain, but it didn't seem to be anything crazy. So I didn't see which way the wind was coming. But you know, if, as long as it's not crazy blowing out there, I think it might be, not be too bad. Yep. Check the, the buoy off the cook plant. I think it's still out there. I don't think they moved that yet. Yeah. And, and then Karen was saying, I, I, hate, I hate to say, but with uh, barrel trauma, he had a very low chance of survival. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I think that's all I got. Let's take a look at Discord, see if we have anything else going on in there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I, th I think we're good. So thank you, everybody, for listening to the program. We're slowly going to get this dialed in. Uh, and and what you can't see here, and I'm not going to show this week, but I have done some more setup here in my dive bunker. I added another desk, so we can actually have a couple people here because we talked about like you'd you'd mentioned before the show your daughter and doing some some video that that's why they did it all in one place because they didn't want to do the streaming. Uh, when yeah. I had Jim here and we did that video, that was which is one of our our better viewed videos. Uh, the challenge was is that he was here. It takes it's like all the work we've done with streaming and being in the same place. You we have a different set of issues, which is separate mics and sound interfering and then syncing. You know what? You know is the audio synced with the video? And so um, I'm in the process now of setting up this so that we could have two of us here and do a live broadcast, or we we could either record it. Or we could do it live. Mm -hmm. So, uh, getting back to working on those a list of things because I, I really want to start doing some focused videos and getting them out there because I think those would be of interest a little bit different than our podcast format, uh, more of a reference video format. So, yeah. that will be coming up. Uh, thank everybody who's supporting the show. Hopefully, you're getting some value. If you are. Uh, go to our website, click on one of the articles, click on the Patreon link, or you can go direct to Patreon at patreon.com forward slash scuba obsessed. Any amount would be appreciated. If it's worth a dollar, give us a dollar. If it's worth a thousand dollars, heck, you know, write that check. <laughs> we'll, we'll take it. Uh, as Adam Curry said, your time, your talent, or your treasure, we appreciate any of them. But uh, that's what it is. Uh, you know, it's... And if you have some ideas and things you'd like to see or something that you don't even think that we would normally do, but you'd like, uh, let us know. Maybe that's something that we can accommodate. I've, I've, and when I originally started this, I thought we'd be doing a lot more uh, gear, shirts, T-shirts, some of that stuff. So maybe we'll we'll get and do that. Uh, maybe we'll do, because I, I, if I was to do this over again before I start the podcast, I'd actually have something to sell. <laughs> something that makes some money, because it's certainly not hosting a podcast uh, but we appreciate it we appreciate everybody's listening downloading the program share it with your friends uh if you can do one thing for us you know if you if you don't have the money don't care to spend it if you could go log into youtube find our videos and uh you know watch them and like them uh subscribe to the channel that will help us out a great deal I see the numbers and how many people are listening, and it's quite a bit, you know, orders of magnitude larger than what we got in the video. So, you know, maybe video is not your thing because I know it's a different audience we'll get with the podcast versus the video. But uh, the way YouTube works, to get discovered, you really want to get on it. So we're slowly improving the quality of those and upgrading, and it will come. And we're getting that time of year where we got the, uh, the hosting fees. So I've dreaded logging to my hosting account because it's a big check I got to write here pretty soon. But I can't avoid it or we'll go off the air. So I'll, I'll get back in there. Uh, Mac, you have anything you want to plug before we get on out of here? No, 
Uh, I think you pretty much capture it. Uh, support for the program is probably number one. Yep. Yep. And uh, so, what, whatever you feel like and you seems appropriate, then that's what we do. Oh, I've got some jokes. Are you you ready for something like that? I can't guarantee they're Absolutely. funny, but I guarantee that they'll take a couple minutes to talk to, to say. So, uh, and, and I've got some because I, I didn't know which ones were good. So we'll start with the first one. My wife was so mad at her husband, she packed his bags and told him to get out. As he walked out the door, she yelled, I hope you die a long, slow, painful death. He turned around and said, so you want me to stay? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, here, uh, That's when he hears that gunshot almost. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that would uh, cut the life expectancy a little bit. Speaking of life expectancy, a secret to a long life. A tough old cowboy from Texas counseled his granddaughter that she wanted to live a long life. The secret was to sprinkle a little bit of gunpowder in her oatmeal every morning. The granddaughter did this religiously until she was the age of 103 when she died. She left behind 14 grandchildren, 30, oh, 14 children, 30 grandchildren, 45 great grandchildren, 25 great great grandchildren, and a 40 foot hole where the crematorium used to be. <laughs> That's a cute one. Yeah. And then I was, I was talking to him uh, with my boss. And uh, he pulled up to work with a sweet new car in the morning, and I complimented on it. He replied, well, if you work hard, set goals, stay determined, and put in long hours, I can get an even better one next year. <laughs> and then the, how about this? Uh, a man and his wife uh, were at a restaurant, and the husband kept staring at an old drunken lady swigging her gin at a nearby table. His wife asked, do you know her? Yes, sighs the husband. She's my ex-wife. She took to drinking right after he divorced seven years ago, and I hear she hasn't been sober since. My God, says the wife. Who would think a person go on celebrating that long? <laughs> uh, I've heard something similar, but it generally was the opposite. <laughs> well, we just had kind of had to wrap it all up. So, Yeah, yeah. On that note, go And even on for both sides. Yes. So on that note, go out there and get wet. And stay safe diving. <laughs>